The Song Dynasty of China is often overlooked in the West. And now I'm going to change that because you're all missing out on learning about the unofficial Kung Fu Dynasty of China. And it is low-key my favorite dynasty. In the Chinese cultural imagination, this dynasty has strong connections to various martial arts and wuxia literature. One of the four classic Chinese novels and a proto-wuxia fiction, Water Margin, is set during this period. And so is Jin Yong's highly influential Legend of the Condor Hero series. Yue Fei, the most famous historical Chinese general and the legendary creator of the Xing Yi Kung Fu style also lived in this period. And even the first emperor of Song Dynasty, Zhao Huangying, was credited with the creation of a subtype of the popular Long Fist Kung Fu style. To be fair, this is just according to the traditional narrative though. Of course, historically, we can't 100% verify if he really invented this style. But history itself had rarely ever been more mundane than fiction. So in this episode, I will tell you about the history of the rise of Zhao Kuangying, Song Dynasty reunification of China, and the mystery of a thousand years old who done it. Zhao Kuangying, the future first emperor of Song Dynasty, was born during the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms period. It was a chaotic era that took place after the Tang Dynasty, when China was fragmented. Yeah, I know, again. During this period, a series of five dynasties claimed the legitimacy of the Tang Dynasty in rapid succession, until finally, Zhao Kuangying established the Song Dynasty along the same line of succession and reunified China. As for the ten other kingdoms, they were just challengers that didn't have much chance of winning. The interesting thing here is that all these emperors who established these five dynasties are actually all connected to each other. Zhu Wen, who established the later Liang dynasty, the first of the five dynasties, was a colleague of Li Keyong. They used to work together, quelling Huang Cao's rebellion. But then, the serial backstabber Zhu Wen tried to assassinate the latter, but failed. Thus, they became arch enemies. Eventually, it was Li Keyong's son, Li Chunqu, who conquered the later Liang dynasty and established the later Tang dynasty. And all the successive emperors of the five dynasties, later Jing, later Han, and later Zhou, had all worked for either Li Keyong or his son Li Chunqu at one point, including Zhao Kuangying's father, Zhao Hongying, who was a minor general under Li Chunqu. So that's why, despite all the chaos, the death toll was not excessively high. The change of dynasties feel a lot like a change of management when you are working for a corporation with lots of boardroom backstabbings. As long as you smile and nod and continue to perform your job well, you will remain employed. Fan Zi famously survived all five dynasties doing this, and he even ended up becoming one of Song Dynasty's chancellors. I covered this period in more detail in a previous video, Check it out if you want to know more. Anyway, let's go back to the story of Zhao Kuangying. He was born in 927, during the later Tang Dynasty. As a young man, he was brave, physically fit, and skilled in horsemanship and archery. His mother, Lady Du, had strong influence on him. As for his brother, who was 12 years younger than him, was his mirror opposite. He did not get along with other kids. In fact, they were even afraid of him. He was also a bookworm, well-versed in the various arts. This boy will become the second emperor of Song Dynasty, under mysterious circumstances, after the sudden death of his brother. No, I'm not going to spoil what happened yet. You will get all the details soon enough. Anyway, during his youth, Zhao Kuangying traveled and adventured through the land. We don't have the details of his travels, but this missing piece of history fueled the imagination of storytellers, often depicting him as an adventurer hero. And one day during his travel, he met a fortune-telling monk who told him to go north. That's where he will find his fortune, he said. So Yang Zhao Kuangying followed the suggestion, and up there he discovered Guo Wei, the future emperor of the later Zhou dynasty. At the time, he was just a general working for the later Han dynasty, and he was putting down a rebellious general. This period is just utterly plagued with mutinies and insubordinations. 
In fact, in just a few short years after Zhao Kuangying joined Guo Wei's army, his boss, the post Yang Emperor of later Han Dynasty, and founded the later Zhou Dynasty. Guo Wei only enjoyed being an emperor for a few years until he was succeeded by his adopted son, Guo Rong, in 954. Now, Guo Rong was a talented warrior emperor. He led battles personally, and it was under his command that Zhao Kuangying started to gain fame and rise in the ranks. During one of his battles against the Kingdom of Northern Han, which was a vassal of the Kitan Liao dynasty, he discovered that the inner core of the royal guards were old and cowardly career soldiers who surrendered at the drop of a hat. You know, think about it. If they remain to be a soldier until their ripe old age, it means that they are not the type of warriors who would fight to the death. The old soldiers were then dismissed, and Zhao Kuangying was given the task to rebuild the royal guards into a formidable force. He completed the task brilliantly, and this is where he created a loyal following of elite soldiers. Zhao Pu, a future chancellor of Song Dynasty, also joined Zhao Kuangying around this period. Guo Rong's expedition against the Northern Han and Southern Tang were quite successful. If he had lived longer, he would have had a pretty good chance of reuniting China. But then, one day, on his northern expedition against the Kitan Liao dynasty, he discovered a piece of wooden plank. The characters written on it said that the commander-in-chief of the royal army will become the emperor. This aroused Guo Rong's suspicion. His current commander-in-chief, Zhang Yongde, was indeed quite powerful, and he could seize the throne from his son if he wanted to. Soon after, Guo Rong fell terribly sick. Ironically, as he lay sick on his deathbed, he replaced Zhang Yongde with Zhao Kuangying as the commander-in-chief of the royal army, thinking that he was a safe choice. After Guo Rong died in 959, he was then succeeded by his six-year-old son, Guo Zhongxun. On the next year, there were reports of the Kitan army marching southwards, so Zhao Kuangying was sent to intercept them. And as soon as they marched, there was growing discontent about the child emperor, who the soldiers don't think would appreciate their hard work fighting for the empire. Oh, if only their commander-in-chief Zhao Kuangying could become the emperor, just as the prophecy had said, they mused. So, with weapons in hand, they went to see his younger brother, Zhao Kuangyi, and the army secretary, Zhao Pu, and demanded for Zhao Kuangying to become their emperor. The two of them and other officers agreed to help the soldiers. And on the next morning, while Zhao Kuangying was still asleep, the mob burst into his camp with weapons in hand and cried out, We are now without a master, so we will make you our emperor. Before Zhao Kuangying could properly wake up, they draped him in imperial yellow robe and declared him their emperor. Oh no, how dreadful. He was forcibly made their emperor. He never wanted this, but he just couldn't refuse. Since he was the subject of the previous emperor, it would be improper for him to harm the young emperor and his mother. So he ordered everyone to do them no harm and banned the army from looting on the pain of death. Thus, he marched back home and deposed the child emperor while facing virtually no resistance. He then guaranteed the emperor's family a good life and protected them as he established his very own Song dynasty. Everything I've told you came right out of the Song Dynasty official history. But historians through the ages have always been skeptical of the official narrative. What happened to the invading Kitan army? How did they just happen to have yellow imperial robe with them? Did Zhao Kuangying plan this himself? Or were there other conspirators who borrowed his popularity to make a power move? When the news reached Zhao Kuangying's mother, now Empress Dowager Tu, she did the whole unimpressed Asian mom thing. She knew that her son was ambitious, so she wasn't really surprised by the news. But there is actually a deeper reason for her lack of joy. She told her son that, It is very difficult to be an emperor. The emperor is the one above millions. If he can rule the people justly, then the position of emperor is respected. But if he loses control of the situation, it is impossible for him to become an ordinary man again, even if he wants to. This is my worry. In essence, she is saying that the sword of Damocles has been hung above her son, and there is no way of getting out of this situation now. Here is a bit of a life lesson for you all. 
in business dealings and various other projects. When the enterprise fails, it is usually the leader who had to take complete responsibility. Sure, the subordinates may risk becoming unemployed, but it is the leader whose head will roll if they fail. So that's why sometimes it is your subordinates who will pursue a project or even start a war at your risk. So we can't really say for sure that the generals weren't complicit in the coup or had no hand in orchestrating it all. Zhao Kuangying knew that the biggest obstacle to his empire's stability were his very own generals and their loyal subordinates. Even if his comrades were loyal to him, it didn't mean that their subordinates would not push them to steal his throne, just like how they pushed him onto the very throne he is currently sitting on. So he had to neutralize this threat by doing the unthinkable. He just asked them to retire and promised lots of pension money and arranged marriage between their families to tighten their bond. Yeah, that is very unorthodox for founding emperors. You would usually expect quite a lot of surprise execution for these lads. But Zhao Kuangying was different. He succeeded in convincing them to resign and fairly compensated them for it. This emperor was skilled in both the application of hard and soft power. He quelled open rebellions by force, obviously, but his generosity allowed for an easy surrender by his enemies. He pretty much used the same trick against most of the other kingdoms as he went on to conquer them. He built fine mansions in the capital for the other kingdom's royal families and promised them that they will live in luxury if they were to just surrender. Obviously, that wasn't enough to convince many of them. Why live as a petty noble when you can be a king or even an emperor in your own country? But they quickly changed their minds when they were thoroughly beaten on the battlefield. He was also very good at maintaining good PR. He ordered his troops to never destroy or loot the civilians' homes and properties. And that's how he ended up conquering most of the other kingdoms, doing most of the hard work until there were a few insignificant kingdoms left when that incident happened in 976. Late that year, Zhao Kuangying felt sick, so he summoned his brother and had a good long talk with him, and the latter left the palace around midnight. But on the next morning, the emperor was discovered to be dead by his empress. She quickly ordered her attendant to summon the emperor's son to make him the new emperor. The attendant quickly left, but instead of going to the prince's residence, he went to Zhao Guangyi's residence because he knew that the emperor had promised the throne to his younger brother. According to the official history of Empress Dowager Du, on her deathbed in 961, she had made Zhao Kuangying promise to pass the throne to his brother. Her reason for doing this was because if he passed his throne to a younger and inexperienced heir, would be ruined just like his predecessors. So for the sake of the empire's stability, he should make his brother his successor. His chancellor, Zhao Pu, who was also present at the time, was then ordered to sign a document as a witness. This document was then locked away in a golden shelf. And this event was later called the Promise of the Golden Shelf. Of course, this is according to the official history. When Zhao Guangyi reached the palace before his nephews, he knew he had won, and he guaranteed his sister-in-law her and her children's safety. Thus, he became the second emperor of Song Dynasty. There are a lot of unsolved mystery about this whole affair. Many historians throughout history have suspected that he engineered his succession. There was even an apocryphal story of someone seeing Zhao Guangyi's shadow moving vigorously under the flickering candlelight that night and the sound of an axe chopping into snow can be heard. This apocryphal story is called The Sound of Axe Under the Candlelight's Shadow. It is also doubly suspicious that Zhao Pu, who fell out with the late emperor a few years ago and demoted from his position as chancellor, was recalled back to the palace and promoted into becoming a chancellor again. A few years later, the new emperor's eldest nephew conveniently committed suicide, and the other died of some illness. With not many of the Ten Kingdoms left, Zhao Guangyi completed the unification of China easily by 979. Oh, as a side note, Yang Ye, 
the Grand Patriarch featured in the Young Family General Folk Story was working for the last of the Ten Kingdoms that remained, Northern Han. When it was defeated, he also surrendered and started working for the Song Dynasty to defend China against the Kitan Liao Dynasty. But unlike his elder brother, Zhao Guangyi was not a warrior, and his various expeditions against the Kitans to take back lost Chinese lands failed miserably. Even the legendary general Yang Ye was killed in one of these disastrous expeditions, and his family members went missing. This actually became the main plot point for the folk story of the Yang family's women rising to the occasion and became women generals to bring the boys back. Knowing that he won't be able to outdo his brother in the battlefield, Zhao Guangyi decided to leave his mark in the realm of civil affairs. He promoted literacy and economic development, and this caused the empire to shift its focus away from warrior generals to civil bureaucrats. So he was the reason why nerds ruled the court of the Song Dynasty. Alright, that's the history of the Song Dynasty. Obviously, Zhao Guangyi, the second emperor's ascension, was very suspicious. But do you think that he could have taken part in more conspiracy besides his own ascension? Could he have engineered his own brother's ascension too? Comment below and tell us your theory. Anyway, if you like this kind of cool history, then subscribe! because we've got plenty more to come. And before I go, I would like to thank my Patreon supporters for helping to make these videos possible. Until next time, stay cool my bros!